All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Lane, and I am the Special Collections Librarian for the Indianapolis Public Library. And I'm located in the beautiful Central Library, downtown Indianapolis. Today, I'm here with our presenter, James Madison, who will be sharing insights from his latest book, The Ku Klux Klan in the Heartland. Before we get started, I wanna share a few things with you all concerning upcoming programs for the Indianapolis Special Collections Room. On Thursday, December 3rd, from noon to one, we will have Butler University archivist, Sally Childs Helton to present on how to save your stuff archivally at home. Whether you have old photographs or a family Bible, Sally will give you tips and tricks on how to preserve these items for future generations. Plus the first 50 people to sign up will get a free copy of Saving Stuff by Smithsonian curator, Don Williams. So come prepare with any specific items that you already have at home that you would like to preserve. And lastly, on Sunday, December 13th, from two to three, we'll have a talk with local author, David Leander Williams, titled African Americans in Indianapolis, the history of a people determined to be free. Here, author David Leander Williams give a panoramic overview of events that occurred in Indianapolis and in their relationship to the New York Times 1619 project. Both of these programs will be held virtually and you can sign up through our website at ndpl.org. Now on to today's program. I will send out a survey for you all to be so kind and fill out and tell us what you thought of today's program. This program would not be possible without the partnership with the Marion County Historical Society and their dedication to doing the hard work of making sure that we know our Indianapolis and Indiana history. Our presenter today is a history professor at IU Bloomington and author of several books such as Hoosiers, A New History of Indiana, and A Lynching in the Heartland, Race and Memory in, in America. Today's talk focuses on James Madison's new title, Ku Klux Klan in the Heartland, which provides further historical analysis of the Klan and their operations in Indiana and throughout the Midwest. Without further ado, it is my honor to welcome James Madison. Thank you, Stephen. I'm uh, getting my slides up and um, No worries. Take I, I have to get that out of the way. Sorry, we're having a little another little bit of uh, issue here. Here we go. Here we go. And now I think uh, you can see that first slide. Is that correct, everyone? I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's a uh, a gray, dreary Sunday afternoon in Bloomington and probably in Marion County as well. And I see some names of folks who are from other places. So uh, uh, thank you all for coming out this afternoon. I'm going to do in less than an hour a lot of history. Uh, so it'll be rather perfunctory and uh, uh, bits and pieces. But um, um, well, why is this not working? There we go. Um, this, is a, this is a tough subject. Um, the Ku Klux Klan in Indiana in the 1920s. It's not a happy story. And we've had a tradition in Indiana with uh, stories that are not happy of ignoring them and hoping they'll go away, sweeping them under the carpet and just whistling in the dark. That has never worked. Uh, we tried that for nearly a century with the Klan and it has not worked. Uh, the other alternative is to create stories that are untrue, myths, to build myths, often deliberately, that make us feel good about our past by ignoring stories that are not feel-good stories. We write comfort history. We tell bedtime stories suitable for children. Uh, we do what some have called for recently patriotic history, which I call fake history. This is the Indiana we all love, this bucolic photograph from the great photographer Frank Hohenberg in this time of the season of corn and pumpkins. Uh, but this is also the Indiana of the 1920s, of burning crosses across all 92 counties in our state. The first point, and in some ways the most important point I wanna make about the Ku Klux Klan in Indiana is that it was not on the margins of our history that it was mainstream. You can't not put this in a sidebar 
and just recognize it in passing. You can't understand Indiana, you can't understand India, America in the 1920s or in the decades before or after, I believe, without incorporating this American story into our total history. I want to read to you the first paragraph of this book. This is the Klan marching down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. in 1926 in the summer. Here's the first paragraph. The Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s was as dark as the night and as American as apple pie. More forcefully than any organization before or since, it pushed into the national conversation the question of who is an American. Plan answers came in voices of extraordinary power. Those voices ring into the 21st century, even if the tones have changed. A central purpose of this book is to demonstrate that there can be no American history without a history of the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan was everywhere in the 1920s. It was not exclusively Southern. It was very strong, perhaps stronger in the North than in the South, from New Jersey and New York State across the Midwest to Washington State and Oregon and California. The Klan attracted millions of members in the 1920s. Here's a pamphlet to recruit Klan members of interest to white Protestant native born Americans who want to keep America American. Uh, one of the great myths that we've created to feel better about this story is to assume, as one reporter, a great reporter actually wrote in a visit to Indiana in the 1920s, that the folks who joined the Klan were hillbillies, the great unteachables, the great unwashed, marginal people. That's simply not true. Uh, all right, I'm having, there we go. Uh, we now know a lot about the membership from various studies by several historians from membership lists, including new membership lists that have just become available at the Indiana Historical Society. We know that they were all ranges of Hoosiers, that they were mostly middle class or lower middle class, all kinds of occupation, professional, working class, farmers, masons, good Hoosiers in their own definition of what that meant. They were 100% Americans, and the Klan thrived on that label. They pushed that label into the mainstream to make it normal to glory in the accolade. 100% Americans, that is white, native-born, Protestant Americans. This Ford service station in Indianapolis solicits the patronage of 100% Americans who are served by 100% American workers. There's a very close affiliation between the Indiana clan and the Protestant churches, Methodists, Baptists, Disciples of Christ, Quakers, and others. This is the insignia that the clan members wore on their robe. It's the cross set in a field of red with the drop that Jesus shed for mankind, for humankind. That is full of meaning, of religious belief for those who joined the clan. And I don't want to I don't want to in any way denigrate religious belief. I think it's exceedingly important in this context and it's, it's important to sort out what it meant to those people. But I don't deny that many of them had a genuine religious belief in their God and their faith. And it was, it was the kind of religious belief uh, that creates this wonderful scene from Indiana in the 1920s of, uh, of a baptism in the middle of winter. This is a scene that was familiar across Indiana on a Sunday morning during church service. Robe members of the Klan would walk into a church down the central aisle up to the altar and place a cash offering in the altar plate while the congregation and choir sang the old wicked cross, a favorite hymn of the day and of the Klan. There were Klan funerals of all sorts. There were Klan weddings. Here's a Klan funeral in which uh, the Attendees are women, clan women. Uh, the deceased is a woman. She's being buried with her clan robe on the top of the casket. The clan had lots of enemies. 
like other organizations of this sort, the Klan was very good in convincing its members and would-be members that there were things to fear, lots to fear out there from enemies. The number one enemy of the Klan, another myth we've created for a variety of reasons, was Catholic Americans. It's hard to explain today in the 21st century what anti-Catholicism was in our country, but from Puritan times down to the recent past, it was deep and vigorous within the Protestant churches as recently as the 1960 election where old timers will remember John Kennedy was attacked in some quarters or feared because he was a Catholic. In the 20s, it is very, very, very much alive in the Protestant churches and the Pope and the bishops and the priests were the enemy. They were foreign. They were not 100% Americans. They were dangerous in all sorts of ways. And so the press is full and Klan propaganda is full of Catholic conspiracies of these sorts. My favorite is in terms of Marion County history that Cathedral High School in Indianapolis was recruiting from the public schools uh, boys who had been expelled for disciplinary reasons and training them, especially if they are big and strong, to be recruited by the University of Notre Dame football team, which was achieving considerable glory in the 1920s, much to the distress of the Ku Klux Klan. Klan also accused the, uh, the priests at Cathedral and elsewhere of allowing boys and girls to, uh, in those schools to uh, chew chewing gum, which was another no-no. Many Catholics are immigrants, and immigrants are the second big enemy to fear in America. All sorts of immigrants coming to America, especially from Eastern and Southern Europe, from Italy and Sicily, from Poland and Lithuania, people who were not like us, who in no way would ever be 100% Americans, who may not even have been white Americans. Much to fear about, uh, about immigrants. Every time I admit someone in the room, they, I can't get back to my slides. Okay, here's, here's what we today, I hope, would glory in, this diversity of kids in a public library in Lake County, Indiana, from all over, from all over, these kids are proudly showing their origins. We might, I hope, glory in this today, but in the 1920s, this is what was wrong with America. One of the great successes of anti-immigration Americans in the 1920s was the passage of this legislation, the National Origins Quota Act, which the Klan claimed credit for. There were others who pushed it, but the Klan was certainly a force. It created a complex system for deciding who could enter the United States and who could not. By setting up quotas, immigrants from Northern and Western Europe could come in larger numbers from Eastern and Southern Europe in much smaller numbers, from Asia, zero. Closing the door to those kinds of less desirable immigrants, an immigration act that stood mostly until 1965 and created a horrible twist in our immigration system, a victory for the Ku Klux Klan. So Catholics and immigrants are the enemy, and of course, Jews are the enemy. Another old, long tradition in Protestant and Christian America, anti-Semitism, which runs deep from the very beginning, from the first Europeans who arrived on our shores down to the present. Anti-Semitism in all forms, but the Klan really picked up on this and again, filled its newspapers and speeches with, with myth and, and outrageous propaganda and prejudice. This is one of the Klan's major speakers, a fascinating woman, Daisy Douglas Barr, a, uh, a Quaker minister. That's not, that's not contradictory if you understand the Klan of the 20s, who became also a leader in the Indiana Republican Party, vice chair, in fact. Uh, and she promised that Protestants were in Indianapolis were going to bo boycott Jewish merchants and that they would drive, therefore, Jewish merchants out of the city of Indianapolis. That, of course, never happened, but it's reflective of the kind of prejudice the Klan sold. And finally, of course, African Americans. You knew this was coming. From 1619 to the present, African Americans had been made second-class citizens by white Americans and were kept in their place by all sorts of legal and extra-legal restrictions and forms of discrimination and hostility. You can get a sense of that in this film, which some of you will know and all of you should know and see if you can, 
The Birth of a Nation, one of the great films in American film history, a horrible film, its portrayal of, of African Americans, a uh, nasty, vicious uh, portrayal, but a film that was very popular in Indiana that showed in Indiana theaters in the 1920s and across the nation. Good white folks went to see this feel, film and glory in what it showed them on the screen. So these are the enemies. The enemies that ought to be taken into the middle of the ocean and sunk. The big four. Catholics above all. Part of this is based upon the science of eugenics, which has a real popularity by the 1920s. It comes from the best universities, the best scientists in our country. These are not marginal people. These are scientists at Yale and Berkeley and Indiana University who create this racial hierarchy with all sorts of pseudo-scientific experiments. A racial hierarchy in which white people are at the very top, of course, and you go down that hierarchy to less and less human qualities uh, in terms of skin color and other characteristics until you reach black African people at the very bottom of the racial hierarchy. This is eugenics. This is the science of race, widely, widely preached by the Klan in the 20s, widely believed by, by white Americans, and still a part of white culture in some, in some places, in some serious ways, I believe, in the 21st century. There was also a notion that these newcomers, people coming from all over the world, especially from Eastern and Southern Europe, African Americans coming from Alabama and Mississippi and Tennessee, all sorts of other changes were causing whites to be committing unwillingly race suicide. Another idea the Klan pushed in the 20s that we can still see today in the 21st century. The Klan was a reform movement. Again, something difficult on the surface to understand, but good Hoosiers trying to make Indiana and America better in their own view of what better was. One of the worst worst sins in America in the 20s was the failure to enforce prohibition, that great experiment that most Klan members put at the very top of priorities. Uh, prohibition must be enforced, and if the legal authorities aren't going to do it, here are Indianapolis policemen proudly showing the results of their raid on a still. Uh, if the legal authorities aren't going to do it, we, the members of the Klan, are going to do it. We're going to create extra legal ways vigilante justice to make sure that this law and all the laws and our own ideals of what moral righteousness is are followed by everyone. Another great source to Klan members and in Klan uh, preachings is the kind of new sex and sin that the Roaring Twenties, the Jazz Age, the age of the flappers brought. You could see it Again, often they write about this and talk about this in the movies coming out of Hollywood. Hollywood, of course, run by Jews, a Jewish conspiracy to tear down the best of America by showing these films with their reckless disregard of conventions. And these kinds of films, which really are a bit salacious, uh, just outraged mainstream Protestant Hoosiers in the 1920s, many of them though many of them also flocked to the movie theaters in small towns and big cities. Special place of sin was, of course, Indiana Avenue. And I suspect Mr. Williams will be talking about this next week. Uh, on the avenue, there were all sorts of nightclubs and bars and places for music and fun and pleasure. And some young, hip, cool white folks began to go to the avenue. And it outraged the Klan, especially the idea of relationships between black men and white women, a, a, a an anxiety that runs through, more than an anxiety, a deep, deep obsession that runs through white America for centuries. It's hard for us to believe that these people were serious sometimes, but you must take my word for it, they were very, very serious. There were some hangers on, there were some who joined it just because it was the fun thing to do. There were some who joined it because it was a way to make a quick buck. But I believe after spending three years reading uh, the sources, the primary documents, the letters, the newspapers, uh, having to do with the Klan in the 20s, 
I've come to the conclusion that they were very, very serious. And you can sort of see it in photographs like this. They're proud, these Klan members in Hartford City standing between the American flag and the Christian flag have their masks raised. They are very proud of who they are, as are these women in Newcastle gathered in the evening. Uh, there's only one of them on the right who still has her mask down. We'd like to talk to her and know what she was thinking, but all the others standing proud. Women are a very important part of the Klan. There were gender issues within the Klan. Men were not so sure about women's role, what women's role was, but this is, this is a time when women with the suffrage movement and in other ways are beginning to move out of church and kitchen and parlor and take a more active, aggressive lead in reform movement. And women who join the Klan are often very much of that sort. They're very eager to make sure that the Catholic parochial schools do not interfere with the rights of the public schools. They're very eager to work on uh, against bigotry and graft and corruption that they believe is rampant in American towns and across the nation. Another fundamental point about the Klan, uh, which again, makes the conclusion that this was not a bunch of unteachables, not a bunch of rubes, is that it was a very sophisticated business organization. This is a manual, a Klan management manual. It's full of detailed instructions of how to run your clavern, of how to organize, recruit, take care of the treasury, services, and all sorts of aspects of Klan life. The Klan did have business partners of all sorts. Here are two from Indianapolis, a jeweler selling Klan swag, and a the 100% publishing company producing Klan sheet music. Partnerships between businesses and the Klan, each hoping to benefit from that relationship in selling their products. The Klan was very sophisticated at putting on theatrical performances, carefully organized, spectacular in their, in their display. This parade, like many parades, hundreds of parades across Indiana like this one, the American flag leading the way, a long line of road marchers, usually followed by cars uh, having <clears throat> uh, electric crosses uh, lit on the back of the car, and sometimes wagons. These, these parades almost always had a band, often two or three marching bands. This is the great day of marching bands. This is the band that claimed to be, and often was cited as the best marching Klan band in Indiana and maybe in the Midwest, the band from Muncie. Um, they're gathering, getting ready to start marching. They're wearing their purple capes that identify them, the Muncie Klan band. Uh, there's a, in the, in the left, near left, there's a saxophone player. And I've always wanted to talk to this guy because in the 20s, in many circles, the saxophone was the instrument of the devil. The saxophone music caused dancers on the dance floor at roadhouses to, uh, to do outrageous things on the floor and maybe after leaving the floor. And yet here we have in the Klan band, a saxophone, maybe, maybe a sophisticated part of the Klan's response to audiences. Here's an all-girl clan band getting ready to march in Newcastle. Here's one of the greatest, the greatest actually, spectacle the clan put on in the 1920s, one of the greatest spectacles in American history. Thousands of people gathered outside of Kokomo and Alfalfa Park over the 4th of July in 1923 for several days with all kinds of social activities, uh, all kinds of speakers, uh, and of course ending in the evening with a cross burning and a naturalization ceremony, that is an induction of new members. This conclave in Kokobo is widely celebrated in Klan lore. The Klan made lots of efforts to, <clears throat> to attract new members, to keep its members, uh, to entertain them, to seduce them. Uh, sheet music, lots of music, and sheet music in particular, the bright fiery cross. Uh, photograph records uh, recorded many of them at Jeanette Studios in Richmond, Indiana, the same place where the black trumpeter from New Orleans uh, made one of his earliest recording, uh, also made lots of Klan photograph records. Um, Klan movies, perhaps nothing testifies to the sophistication of the Klan more than the two movies that the Klan made. Uh, this one's made in Indianapolis by the Cavalier Production Company, part 
owner is D.C. Stevens and the Grand Dragon. And here it's showing at Cater Tabernacle, one of the big venues in downtown Indianapolis, uh, with all sorts of stuff going on, including the Cato Choir of 500 Voices for the benefit of the Lawrence Methodist Church. Second clan movie is called The Toll of Justice. It's made in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in Columbus, Ohio. And it too shows across Indiana and across the Midwest. Silent films to, to, to counter the kind of evil that was shown in many Hollywood films and to make the Klan respectable and normal to Americans. The Klan had its own newspaper, the Fiery Cross, a wonderful source of, of insight into the Klan and anyone can now read all, almost all issues of the Fiery Cross because they're digitized at the IUPUI library and uh, for whatever sins, I spent uh, many, many, many weeks reading the Fiery Cross and uh, um, after a while, it gets really old and boring, but there's lots and lots of interesting stuff in the Fiery Cross, and you can search it digitally. So uh, if you want to start to learn about the Klan or a particular aspect of the Klan, this is one of the first places uh, to look. Any organization like this with these kinds of values, with these kinds of purposes, is absolutely going to enter politics. And the Klan did that in early 1924 with a vengeance, with a very sophisticated, organized, and well-funded political campaign, beginning in the primary elections in May of 1924. The Klan chose candidates, a few Democrats, but almost all within the Republican Party. And almost all of those Klan Republican candidates won in the Indiana, in the Indiana primary elections in 1924. A few days later, uh, the Klan had a huge, huge parade. Uh, some of the newspapers said it was the biggest parade in recent memory, uh, from the fairgrounds down to Monument Circle and marching near the African-American neighborhood on the west side of Indianapolis. That victory by Republican candidates in 1924 uh, is sealed in the general elections in the fall of 1924 when uh, the Klan Republican ticket swept, the Protestant ticket, the Fiery Cross says, swept the state. The Klan candidates included a majority of the members of the General Assembly many other officers, and the governor of Indiana, Ed Jackson, a close associate of D.C. Stevenson, a very much a Klan governor. In my opinion, uh, Ed Jackson wins the prize of the worst governor in the state of Indiana. I think there's no competition for that. He was not just a, a Klan sympathizer. He was uh, corrupt and in many ways uh, qualifies as our worst governor ever. The following year, uh, the Klan achieves considerable success in local elections across the state of Indiana, including Indianapolis. John Duval, a Klan member, and also a corrupt official who eventually goes to jail, and a majority of the city council and school commission are elected, and the Klan becomes in charge of City Hall in Indianapolis. Of course, there's opposition. I wish I could say that there's lots and lots of opposition, that it's very strong and very effective very immediately. Uh, that's not true. A lot of Hoosiers who oppose the Klan remain silent, and we all know the cost of silence in this sort of situation. But some did stand up, and it was mostly those who were designated as the enemies of the Klan, Catholics in particular. Catholics were beginning to move into the middle class. They were beginning to organize. They were beginning to become more, more able to stand up to the anti-Catholicism that was so rampant in our country. Uh, Catholics formed an organization called the American Unity League, based in Chicago, with an op opposition, an office in uh, Indianapolis, and having speakers, sending speakers out across the state to Fort Wayne and Gary and Jeffersonville, and publishing a weekly newspaper called Tolerance. One of the most uh, amusing and serious things the uh, 
anti-union league did, though they denied responsibility, was to have someone break into the offices of the Klan in Indianapolis and steal the membership. And that's the, uh, the basis for a long story and uh, the basis for this front page of tolerance in uh, 1923. There's opposition from Notre Dame students when the Klan rallies there after its great primary of vic uh, victories in 1924. Uh, Father uh, Walsh at President of Notre Dame tells the students not to leave campus, don't go down there and get into trouble. Of course, the students disobey immediately, as students should do, I think, uh, and, uh, and run downtown, engage in all kinds of shenanigans, including ripping off a few robes and hoods from Klan members. This uh, this uh, Notre Dame student from Fort Wayne uh, proudly displays his trophy of what the Klan called the Notre Dame riot, just like these Irish Catholics. They're always fighting. They're always engaged in illegal activities. African-Americans stand up. This is a very important story. Indiana's, many of Indiana's towns in the time of World War I and just before World War I formed new branches of the NAACP, the most important civil rights organization of the day and down through the 20th century. And they were doing okay, but the Klan gave them a real shot, a real lift, because it was quite clear what the Klan was up to, and it's quite clear that African Americans needed to stand up to this, and they did in very effective ways. Here's a poster from the Indianapolis branch uh, defining their 100% Americanism. And a, a meeting, uh, Independent Voters League, formed in Indianapolis in the early 20s to counter the Klan. I think these are mostly African-American ministers who are going to be speaking here um, uh, at, this, at this gathering. Um, this is emblematic of what's going on politically because African-Americans in Indiana and most places in the North had voted for Republican candidates since the days of Abraham Lincoln. Now the Republican Party is in bed with the Ku Klux Klan. What are they gonna do? And so what NAACP and others like the Independent Voters League is doing is try to convince them to give up their traditional allegiance and vote for the Democratic Party. And in 1924, a majority of African Americans do that in Indianapolis for the first time. It's a very important beginning of a shift that in the 1930s has become very important to political history in Indiana and in the nation. There's of course Jewish opposition. Rabbis in particular play often a leading role and this is one of the great rabbis in Indianapolis history uh, who is a, a witty and marvelous um, antagonist of the Ku Klux Klan. There's the story of Shapiro's, which most of you will know, which was originally the American, the American grocery store, but Mr. Shapiro, threatened by the Klan, uh, puts stars of David out front and changes the name to Shapiro's Kosher Foods. In other words, I'm not gonna be intimidated by you. I'd like to say that Protestant church leaders stood up that Protestant nominations stood up. All, so far as I know, all the major denominations in their state meetings refused to take a stand on the Klan. There were some exceptions. Uh, the Christian Minutes Association of Indianapolis, the Episcopal Diocese in Indianapolis, and of course, individual ministers across the state stood up. Not huge numbers. Most supported the Klan or remained silent, but some did. And one example we have is Reverend Davidson, in Indianapolis who, because he stood up to the Klan, uh, is, uh, is fired from his position, goes on to have a distinguished career in the ministry. Another great hero of the anti-Klan forces, and some of you will know him, is Mayor Lou Shank of Indianapolis, uh, an auctioneer and a vaudeville entertainer and a character of the First Order, but also deeply, deeply opposed to the Klan, who orders that uh, any cross set on fire in the city should be, would be extinguished by Indianapolis firemen, that masks would not be worn in parades, and then decides he's gonna become governor of Indiana. He's gonna run against the Klan in the Republican primary in 1924, runs against Ed Jackson, and of course loses as Jackson overwhelmingly defeats the anti-Klan candidate, Louis Shank. A few newspapers stand up, most don't. 
a few, most notably the Indianapolis Times, which is many of you know, won a Pulitzer Prize for its investigative reporting. Uh, that reporting, I would say in all fairness, was a little late to form as it was in most Indianapolis and Indiana newspapers, uh, a little modest in its attack. This is of course a historian speaking long after the events, Monday morning quarterbacking, easy to say now, harder. If you were sitting in the newsrooms in the editorial office, in the publisher's office of any newspaper in the 1920s, figuring out what to do about this very, very powerful and popular organization. Here's the most outspoken newspaper editor, George Dale of Muncie, who uh, his paper also is, is digitized and you can read his tirades against the Klan and against a local judge who he accused of being a Klan member. That judge sent uh, uh, George Dale to the Delaware County Jail. Uh, Mr. Dale doesn't look all that unhappy to be there. A few cultural leaders, again, not many, but a few. My favorite is Meredith Nicholson, whose house on at uh, 1500 North Delaware still stands and is the home of Indiana Humanities, a great critic of the Klan in all sorts of sophisticated and wonderful ways in his writing and his speaking. Uh, one who did not stand up and Nicholson called him out for not doing that was our great author Booth Tarkin, who given the chance to say something about the Klan said, well, actually they're good people on both sides. So said Booth Tarkin. One very important aspect of the Klan and its strength is how slow and painful the decline was. And I've got to move more quickly now. Um, and this is a, a complicated story. I've got a whole chapter, more than a chapter on this. The basic point is it wasn't over. It lasted for a long time after <clears throat> many folks now think it was over. Because the standard story is that it's over after this guy, this is Grand Dragon DC Stevenson goes to jail to the Indiana State Penitentiary in Michigan City. And that's the end of the Klan. Well, it certainly didn't help the Klan. It hurt the Klan. It caused a drop in membership and in power and prestige, but it's not the end of the Klan. Most of you will know this story. I write about it. Others have written about it. Uh, it has to do with uh, this uh, innocent young woman sitting in her backyard in Irvington. This is an Irvington Historical Society photograph uh, in it with her dog, Madge Oberholzer. And a few years later, Stevenson is convicted of the rape and murder of Abel Madge Oberholzer. That leads to his trial in November of 1925 and to his sentences, but it does not lead to the end of the Klan in Indiana. In the 1928 elections, three years after Stevenson goes to jail, Republican Klan type candidates win across the state. It's not until the 1929 local elections that, uh, that the Republican control is, is finished in Indiana and the Klan is more or less finished in Indiana. And so the question is, is the Klan dead? Is it gone? Is it over? That's a tough question to answer. The answer is yes and no. The ideals of the Klan endure down to our own time, I believe. You can see them across our history, of course, in our basketball history. Someone still needs to write a good book on uh, our basketball history with these social issues, issues of race and others incorporated into the story, deeply into the story. This is the great All-American at IU, Bill Garrett, who when he came from Shelbyville to play in the finals as a high school student was not allowed to stay in the hotel with his fellow players. And who, when he went across the Big Ten with everywhere he played, in Ann Arbor and Evanston, the only African-American on the court. In this story, you all know the story of Crispus Alex, a story which Bobby Plum said, and I will say is as, in fact, I will say more important than the story Hoosiers have loved for so long of the tiny Milan miracle, that great Hoosier story, which we love because it gives us comfort. And it's a more or less true story. But I think historically in terms of central issues, in our past and our present, the attic story is more important. These are changing times. The civil rights movement brings protests in downtown Indianapolis and across the state. It brings Governor George Wallace to Indiana in 1964 to run in the Democratic primary for president. Wallace was staying at the Claypool Hotel 
And uh, these African Americans from the NAACP, the local branch, protest his segregationist, horribly racist uh, campaign in Indiana. Now, Wallace pioneered in many ways. He pioneered in the politics of rage, of saying outrageous things using rage. He pioneered in the use of what we now call dog whistles and coded words. I'm not a segregation, I'm not a racist. Well, he clearly was. I love this photograph. This is a wonderful AP photograph because not only does it show these protesters, it shows this single fellow in the front protesting against the protesters. And he's doing it by waving this flag. This is not the flag of heritage. This is the flag, in my opinion, of treason. This is the flag of those who fired against the United States flag at Fort Sumter. And to see that flag fly on the streets of Washington, D.C. yesterday, to see it fly anywhere, in my view, this is just me as a citizen. You can have your own view, and you're free to fly this flag because we're Americans. Uh, this is an outrageous insult to our best ideas. Okay, what happens here? As the civil rights movement moves forward and African Americans become more uppity in claiming status as 100% Americans, there is space and room for the Ku Klux Klan to revive. And it does revive uh, in central Indiana, especially, but across the state with touches of anti-Semitism and some others other features to it, but it's mostly a white, a white supremacist, white segregation movement, the Klan that revives in the 1960s. It has rallies and parades. Uh, I chose this photograph because I love this photograph. Uh, it's such a Hoosier guy. It's nice to be white. Isn't it sweet? It's just, he's not saying anything hateful. He's just saying it's nice to be white, but he's also using that wonderfully complex word, it's, in a way that uh, <clears throat> is unusual and I guess emblematic. These rallies, which occur all over the state and certainly in Indianapolis, uh, attract more police and media presence than marchers. I love this photograph because it allows me to say very quickly something of great importance. Three African-Americans watching a Klan rally the woman, the younger woman with field glasses, looking as they march by. What is the boy, probably her son, thinking? What is she gonna tell him a few years later when she has to have the talk with him about being an African-American male growing up in this world? What is she gonna tell him? What about the trauma? the Ku Klux Klan and white racism has brought to African-American families for centuries, has created the stories passed down through the generations in African-American families about white Americans. The Klan in Indiana has not been, it was not in the 20s, a dramatically violent organization. There was some violence. I write about this. There was some, but no lynchings. The Klan lynched no one in Indiana that I know of. Uh, there was a little bit of violence later on, the firebombing of the black market in Bloomington, and of course, the horrible tragedy of the murder of Cal Carol Jenkins, Jenkins, which leaves scars in Martinsville to the day. The current embodiments of the Klan are fools like this. Uh, our own Hoosier representative, Matt Heimbach from Paoli in Southern Indiana was instrumental in organizing the Charlottesville rally. Uh, and here he is in the foreground, in the center in full battle gear, uh, preparing to act, enact his white supremacist views, a very sophisticated version of white nationalism, white supremacy. The good news is that in our own day, in the last decades, as I've said, these rallies of Klan members always attract more demonstrators. This one in Madison, Indiana recently where a handful of Klan people were grossly outnumbered by white protesters, good Hoosiers doing the right thing. So the Ku Klux Klan in Indiana was a mainstream organization, a normal organization, not abnormal, not marginal, not strange, not unteachables, a very sophisticated organization that mobilized thousands of Hoosiers 
from the ideals of 100% Americanism. It's a story I think that is mainstream at the center of our history. I love this sculpture. I've used it in the book. Uh, it's by an English sculptor. It's at uh, the Meyer Gardens in outside of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Listening to history is the title. And of course it's ironic because the cords that bind the book of history allow the individual not to see and not to hear and not to read. And so we need to cut those cords. We need to cut those cords so that we can see what's around us, so that we can read good history that helps us understand our past, that helps us see and think and feel where we are and what it means to be an American. Who is 100% American? Who is us and who is them? And when people start to use those kinds of terms, we should know enough for antennae to go up and to be very, very, very vigilant. I do want to end on a positive note and say that personally I believe, certainly I hope, that that great moral arc of the universe is bending toward justice. Not uniformly, not all the time, but over time, slowly, way too slowly, bending toward a justice so that these four kids the greatest kids in the world, my grandkids, of course, will live in an America that understands what Abraham Lincoln, our greatest Hoosier, our greatest American, believed about us and what our finding, founding ideals say about us with liberty and justice for all. Here's my email address. We're not going to have, I guess, a lot of time to talk, but I think we can have a few comments and, and, and questions. I'd be happy to have them, but I'm also happy to, uh, to answer uh, emails if you want to send them to me uh, privately. So thank you very much. Yes, I just want to say thank you so much for that amazing uh, lecture. I feel like I learned so much. Um, if you, anyone has any questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. We did get a few while you were talking. I'll get to some of those. Let's see here. <clears throat> so Shannon, she asked, could you please talk more about the Quaker clan connection? I thought Quakers <laughs> were supposed to be the antithesis of clan. Yes, clan. I know, I know. We, 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 we love the class, uh, Hoosiers. We love, we love the Hoosiers of the anti-slavery movement before the Civil War. And, and those were real, real Hoosier heroes who stood up. The Coffins, of course, but many others. Uh, by the 20th century, Quakers had changed. And I ought to have my good friend and, and colleague from Earlham, um, uh, uh, Tom Ham, to talk about this. But Tom, Thomas Ham has written about this. And a serious interest, you should read all that Tom Ham has written about Quakers. Quakers had changed and moved toward the mainstream, still different from Methodists or Baptists, but moving toward the mainstream. And it's hard, again, at a distance of time to square this, to make it sensible. But if you, if you understand the Klan, and I hope that my book will result in an understanding, you'll see that Quaker ministers like Daisy Douglas Barr are not really weird and strange and wacko, but they represent the beliefs of many in the Quaker churches, in the Quaker, uh, among, among the friends, but also among good Methodists and Baptists. And we have a private message that I was sent, um, and this person asked, how many of these institutions, churches still exist and will admit and atone for their relationships with the Klan? How many will admit today? Yes. Well, I think, I think, uh, I think many, many of the Protestant churches are, are confronting this issue as we speak. I know the Methodists are for sure. Uh, and, and I know they've, they've had various reports and meetings and uh, uh, the Indiana Methodists, are, are, are moving toward taking some kind of stand, some kind of apology for not being more, more courageous, more vigilant in the 1920s. Um, I think other churches are doing that. I think all the institutions, all the institutions of America are, are 
the good ones in my view, are, are working on this, are talking about it, are struggling with it, and it's a very, very hard thing for us to do, uh, a very difficult thing to do, but I, I think it's happening. And this is one of the reasons why I ended as I did with that moral arc bending toward justice. Very nice. And Pamela asked, were children of members recruited too? Were they clan members? Yes, there were. There were, uh, there were junior clan organizations for girls and boys. I have a wonderful picture in the book of a float, uh, I forget where it is, a parade in some place, some town in Indiana, uh, with a, a, um, a group of, of children in clan robes on the float, uh, advocating for the protection of the Little Red Schoolhouse, the public school house against the spread of parochial schools. So yes, children were part of the clan and children attended clan rallies. Uh, there were lots of children at the Great Malfalfa Park rally in Kokomo. Uh, children attended cross burning, so sure. Why not? It's not, a, it's not a horrible, bad organization. This is normal, good stuff. Yes, yes, it was definitely normalized and um, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Oh, we got one more. Um, how about the courts in this era? Were they also clan controlled? Uh, we don't know. I don't know as much about the courts. Uh, I do have, I should have mentioned this. There's one other group that stood up. I'm very, very interested in this. Uh, the annual meeting of the Indiana Bar Association was at West Baden in um, in, in southern Indiana, where a lot of groups gathered because there was free alcohol or other forms of entertainment there. Not that lawyers would engage in that, but at their annual meeting in 1923, there was a lot of discussion about the Klan and the Indiana Bar Associate, Association actually passed a resolution condemning the Klan. It's a very, very forward, a strong condemnation of the Klan by the Indiana Bar Association. And that was a risky thing for lawyers to do, I think. Um, there were judges who were clan members for sure, uh, you know, but uh, you know. Well, I definitely want to thank you, um, and I, I want to um, ask the last question of the day, if I may. Sure. Um, you said the best way to deal with the clan is definitely not ignore them. Um, so, how? should people respond to um, the Klan today? Yeah, that's a, that's a very important question, Stephen. And, and I, I think everyone has to decide for his or herself what, what the best way to respond. I think there has always been, even in the 20s, but especially in the 60s and 70s, arguments to just ignore them. Don't give them, don't give them a publicity. That's what they're seeking. They're performers, of course. They're performing on the stage of history to try to get our attention and to sell their message. And let's just ignore them. Um, I can understand that. I might be convinced of that in some circumstances, but um, we can't allow them to become normal. One, one final point that's related to that that I didn't make. Lots of things in retrospect I should have said and didn't say. Uh, I needed about four or five hours, Stephen. But um, um, <laughs> uh, the danger today is not from men and women in robes. They're, they are a bunch of unteachables. They're pretty hopeless cases, most of them. Uh, the danger today comes from people in, uh, in suits and ties and press shirts and, and in silk blouses uh, who stand up and tell us things that uh, are in dog whistles and code words, but represent in so many ways the ideals of the Indiana clan of the 1920s. I'm struck by the similarity, sometimes even the words. I have a clan speaker in Noblesville in 1925 or so talking about immigration and saying we need to build a wall around America to keep these people out. This is not new. Uh, the current iteration of the clan comes from people not in white robes, the people who are expressing ideals similar to and sympathetic to the clan. Um, thank you so much for such a great talk. And we are, we'll definitely allow to you four or five hours the next time you come back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, James. And thank you everyone for attending today's talk. And I hope you check out the book. I, we have it here available for checkout at the Indianapolis Public Library. Thank you, every, thank you everyone for coming.
and have a good weekend.